War with the Powhatans might have been settling down, but that doesn't mean that Virginia was entering a period of calm herself. In fact, just about the same time that Governor Berkeley set foot on Virginia soil, another character set foot on Maryland soil. That now infamous person spoke against King Charles in a manner deemed treasonous. Governor Berkeley, a man who had his own issues with King Charles before he left England, was now next door to a colony containing Richard Ingle. But Ingle wasn't the only person liable of speaking treasonous proclamations against Charles. Nor was Maryland the only colony containing opposition to the crown. Governor Berkeley discovered that many of those opposed to his king, in fact, served on the governing council and in the colony's highest offices. Treason. This would be Governor Berkeley's biggest fight during his first administration. A fight he'd ultimately lose in the short term. Climb to the top of this hill And I look down at my kingdom before me You stood by the window sill And I wanted to talk to thee Virginia and Maryland endured a rocky beginning. King Charles granted the Calvert family a sizable chunk of land just across the Potomac River in the early 1630s. That gift immediately caused a rift in Virginia because of land on Kent Island that was promised to and settled by William Claiborne. We don't need to rehash that debacle from the Governor Harvey era, which we already covered in the John Harvey's Quagmire episode. Suffice to say for now, the situation was not resolved in a way that William Claiborne had desired. Claiborne's actions saw him lose his position within the colony for a time, but he remained a powerful figure through his extensive trade network throughout the world. But when Governor Berkeley arrived, Claiborne's situation began to improve within the colony once again. Berkeley recalled Claiborne into higher governmental offices, mostly to pacify the wily merchant, and Claiborne wasted little time in taking advantage of his new positions. Notably, Claiborne was given command of the colonial force meant to punish the Powhatans after Opiucancano's 1644 attack. Yet, when Berkeley left for England, Claiborne saw an opportunity to use that force against his bitterly hated Catholic rivals in Maryland. Claiborne's opportunity to strike back at the Calverts came when Richard Engel, once captured but now freed, returned to Maryland aboard the Reformation in February 1645. Engel was awarded and backed by a parliamentary commission to support an uprising against the Catholic-led Maryland colony. Engel's rebellion forced many Maryland leaders, including Leonard Calvert, Lord Baltimore, to flee St. Mary's. Baltimore, with Governor Berkeley's backing, settled in Virginia. Richard Engel, on the other hand, was working together with William Claiborne, laying Maryland's Catholic and Royalist sympathizers bare. They plundered St. Mary's, taking land and possessions of those who would not pledge their allegiance to Parliament and Protestant causes. Claiborne went a step further and moved to reclaim his Kent Island domain from the Calverts. These actions were greatly aided by a prevailing anti-Calvert faction in the Virginia General Assembly. The 1645 Assembly authorized Thomas Willoughby and Edward Hill to go to Maryland in order to take charge of the unsettled colony. Upon arrival, Edward Hill, Speaker of the Virginia Assembly as late as 1644, now took charge of Maryland as her governor in January 1646. Thus, while Berkeley was away, the English Civil War spread her influence into Virginia and Maryland's landscape. When Berkeley returned to Virginia in June 1645, he not only had to handle the Powhatan War, which he did with quick determination, but he also had to navigate the tricky political situation that threatened to divide his colony and also potentially cost him his own head. After Berkeley resettled back in Virginia, he moved to support Leonard Calvert's return to Maryland, an extraordinarily bold decision in that it was directly opposed to many in his colonial government, most especially William Claiborne, 
who was set to lose Kent Island once again. Berkeley then moved to curb the rising Puritan tide in Virginia. Though leading Puritans such as Daniel Gookin Jr. had left Virginia, and Governor Berkeley in no uncertain terms established the Anglican Church as Virginia's only approved institution, there still remained a sizable Puritan enclave along the Pagan River at Bass's Choice and Bennett's Welcome, near modern-day Smithfield and Suffolk. Their ministers refused to adhere to Anglican religious practices, which brought Berkeley's position into conflict, not only with a small group of Virginia Puritans, but also with the now predominant English Puritans who were winning the English Civil War. Berkeley moved to pass stricter laws against Virginia's Puritans during the November 1647 Assembly. The body passed laws according to Berkeley's wishes that demanded all in his colony to follow the Anglican Church's traditions, including using the Book of Common Prayer and paying tithes, or risk punishment. But Thomas Harrison, a one-time friend of Governor Berkeley, decided to spurn Berkeley's laws. Get up and stand real tall Though you put your hands right up to me, me And you still wear that facade around Harrison was a one-time Anglican minister who, after the 1644 Powhatan Uprising, repented of his Anglicanism in exchange for becoming a Puritan missionary to the Nansman people, inhabiting lands just south and west of Bass's Choice and Bennett's Welcome. Harrison, and other Puritans like him, felt no cause for concern over Berkeley's stance against them. In fact, there was a movement to support freedom of religion, that is, Puritanism, across the English colonial landscape from Bermuda to New England and southward into Virginia, spearheaded by colonial leaders and backed by Robert Rich, the Earl of Warwick, Admiral of the Parliamentary Fleet. The English House of Commons also assented to the Puritan cause. Thus, with such backing, it's no wonder that Puritans openly worshipped how their consciences dictated. But Berkeley was opposed to the Puritans, not just on religious, but on political grounds as well. While Harrison continued to minister to the Nansmans, he kept a somewhat regular correspondence with Massachusetts Governor John Winthrop, as well as the Earl of Warwick. That correspondence reveals strong support for nonconformists to settle along the banks of the Potomac River within the site of St. Mary's, as well as the eastern shore southward and into Virginia. In addition, Puritan-dominated English Parliament authorized and sent Thomas Stone to be Maryland's next governor in 1648. In the meantime, Thomas Harrison journeyed to Boston in October and further strengthened his links to the Puritans by marrying Dorothy Simmons, the daughter of the Massachusetts Bay Deputy Governor Samuel Simmons. John Winthrop received news of this wedding with great joy. Berkeley, on the other hand, held no such joy. His stance against the Puritans cost him his former friend, whom he banished, and forced Berkeley to actively oppose the Nansman congregation, thus creating new potential enemies within Virginia. Harrison, for his part, never returned to Virginia after his 1648 wedding. In fact, Harrison fled back to England with his new bride in 1650, became chaplain to Oliver Cromwell's brother, and spoke against Berkeley to Parliament. But before Harrison arrived back in England, however, history-altering events began taking place in England. King Charles and his Royalist Cavalier supporters suffered crushing battlefield defeats throughout 1646. Charles had to retreat to Newcastle, where he was protected by a Scottish Presbyterian army for nine months. But that protection came to an abrupt end after the Scots negotiated a treaty with Parliament. Charles was then taken captive by parliamentary forces in January 1647. The imprisoned king nervously lived out 1647, plotting and scheming ways to regain control, while his former land moved against him at the behest of the victorious Roundheads now firmly in control of England. By late 1648, all attempts to regain power had failed. Charles was put on trial for treason and other high crimes, found guilty, and beheaded on January 30, 1649. The proverbial stone was thrown into the pond, and the subsequent ripples were felt across the water. 
News of the king's beheading caused Berkeley little sorrow. Many of Berkeley's personal connections to Charles, including William's own brother John, were deeply affected. But William had to govern Virginia. To ensure the violent events in England didn't come to Virginia, Berkeley called an assembly together in October 1649, where he made it quite clear that he would not support Parliament. They were murderers. Instead, Berkeley cast his support for Charles II. In so doing, the governor risked antagonizing friends and enemies alike by staunchly supporting the Stuart cause. He further antagonized his enemies by championing free trade with the Dutch. The Matthews Claiborne cabal had powerful parliamentary connections, and together, the faction wanted to get rich off of limiting trade. Specifically, they wanted to enforce laws that would allow Virginia to trade only with England. But the colonial population had been reaping benefits of free trade ever since Berkeley's arrival. In fact, it was Berkeley who strengthened trade with the Dutch by solidifying his relationship with Peter Stuyvesant of New Amsterdam during this period. The Matthews Claiborne faction hated Dutch trade because competition hurt their bottom line. When Berkeley continued to encourage free trade, the Matthews Claiborne faction petitioned Parliament to halt the governor's actions. But because of the Civil War, a response took a few years to craft and enforce. Berkeley's first administration eventually did run her course once parliamentary forces were consolidated. The Matthews Claiborne faction, along with the Earl of Warwick, had enough ammunition in their arsenal to displace William Berkeley by the early 1650s. The chief issue Parliament focused upon was Berkeley's continued support for Charles II and the Royalist cause. The governor had opened communication with the exiled Royalists, including Charles II. The governor had encouraged exiles to come to Virginia and build up the colony as a Royalist bastion from which to undermine Parliament. Charles sent his trusted ministers, Henry Norwood and Francis Morrison, both of whom had close ties with Berkeley, to Virginia in order to carry out a colonial defense. Part of that defense, as Berkeley saw it, was to have the deposed king remove William Claiborne from Virginian office and replace him with Norwood as the colony treasurer, a risky move that riled Claiborne. You talk too much for your heart. It tells you to shift from the start Don't try and touch me there Cause we'll come back around to haunt you Parliament soon realized that Berkeley would remain stolidly royalist. They carefully handled Berkeley's 1649 anti-parliamentary remonstrance with kid gloves, before following up with a navigation law that forbade foreign merchant ships' trade rights without a special license. In other words, the Matthews Claiborne faction, along with the Earl of Warwick, had legally halted free trade with the Dutch, a huge step against Berkeley and his position in Virginia. Realizing what was taking place, Berkeley called together his government in March 1651 to answer the new parliamentary challenge. He stated in no uncertain terms that this new English government worked to enslave the colonists. He intended to withstand their orders, and anyone who felt likewise should follow him either to victory or see him sacrifice his life for their loyalty and security. He followed up his words with a vote concerning the Navigation Acts. The assembly condemned the acts in both houses, and then to rub salt into the parliamentary wound, Berkeley sent the navigation acts to the Dutch. But Berkeley's time soon ran out. The reason why he could be brazen for so long was because Oliver Cromwell and Parliament were busy fighting Charles II's attempt to reclaim the English throne. Yet once that threat was halted at the Battle of Worcester in September 1650, attention could be given to the Virginian issues. On hand in London to assist with the Virginian issue were none other than William Claiborne, Richard Bennett, and Thomas Stegg, ranking members of the Matthews Claiborne faction. Assisting the faction was one Benjamin Worsley, an influential figure among parliamentary leadership. Together, these men influenced the Cromwellian government to remove Berkeley from power. If they didn't remove Berkeley from power, they'd never control Virginia. Further, no one in England could benefit 
that is, reap profits off of Virginia's work, unless the Dutch were eliminated from freely trading within the colony. If need be, the faction argued, an armed force could be raised to remove the stolid Berkeley when the time came. Parliament accepted all recommendations. They doubled down on the trade issue, passed the Navigation Act of 1651 banning all Dutch Virginian trade, commissioned Claiborne, Bennett, and Stegg to reduce the government under the parliamentary banner, and organized a force to be sent with the leading merchants. The small fleet set sail in late fall 1651. They stopped at Barbados to force the island under parliamentary rule before they ventured to Virginia. Along the way, however, one of the ships carrying Thomas Stegg sank during a storm. All lives were lost. The remaining ships made their way to Virginia and anchored at Newport News in January 1652. Bennett and Claiborne wasted little time after their arrival. They sent messengers to Berkeley ordering the governor to surrender. But Berkeley responded by saying nothing and forcing a long, tense standoff during which time Bennett and Claiborne sweet-talked as many prominent men as they could. Berkeley next answered their work by calling up a thousand militiamen to guard Jamestown. Bennett and Claiborne seemed obliged to fight, and proved that point by sailing to Jamestown in March 1652. With opposition ships off the Jamestown coast, Berkeley decided to surrender. The surrender was somewhat calculated, as Berkeley biographer Warren Billings notes. Berkeley won three concessions by his actions. He safeguarded Virginia's political establishment, a major point. Next, he preserved the loyalty of his Virginia allies in standing with Charles II, benefits he'd reap from at a later date. And finally, he protected the property of Virginians opposed to parliamentary rule. Berkeley rightly assumed that no one wanted to fight. No one wanted to risk disaster in Virginia. And on that point, Berkeley and his opposition could agree. Thus, the standoff ended with a whimper, and not a shout. Bennett and Claiborne didn't want to undo political advancements in Virginia, nor did they want to destroy their merchant framework. All they wanted to do was remove economic opposition to their trading plans. And as they saw it, Berkeley was that impediment. And now that he was stepping down, colonial business resumed as normal. That being the case, the negotiations to secure Berkeley's removal were peaceful. And that removal legally came on March 12, 1652. Parliament further solidified Virginia's legal right to the government that they had so painstakingly created over the last few decades. But they did want Berkeley to leave Virginia if he didn't swear loyalty to his new masters. Berkeley never took the oath, nor did any of his followers. And in a second treaty, Parliament relented in that it allowed Berkeley the freedom to choose his own course. If he wanted to go to England, he'd be allowed to do so freely. If he wanted to go to the Netherlands, fine, no one would stand in his way. But Berkeley chose to stay in Virginia on his private lands at Greenspring and serve the colony as a private citizen. For now, the Matthews Claiborne faction had won the day yet again. Richard Bennett became the colony's next governor, William Claiborne resumed his post as secretary, and Virginia was now a parliamentary colony. That might have been the legal case, But Berkeley's call for royalist cavaliers to come exile in Virginia was a call answered by many Stuart supporters. No one knew for sure what would happen during Cromwell's rule. But Virginia kept a watchful eye and a heart beating for a royalist return. A return that, once it happened, was roundly welcomed. A return that would reinstall William Berkeley, a man potentially guilty of treason as Parliament saw it, as her governor once again. Though you put your hands right up to me, me And you still wet half a side around here Though you still wet half a side around Thank you again for supporting the podcast. It's greatly appreciated. Please continue to spread the word and help this colony to keep growing. Start by following us on your favorite podcast provider, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and visit the website.
Sharing episodes and other work is the best way to expand the community. Another way to greatly aid the podcast is by providing feedback on iTunes. If you have yet to do so, please take a few minutes and leave us a comment. Doing so helps bring exposure in the iTunes network. It also helps me to know what I need to improve on in future episodes. If you would like to support the work financially, please consider supporting the podcast on Patreon. Links can be found on the website, or one can visit the campaign at patreon.com forward slash VA HISPOD to see the choices and rewards being offered for your generosity. And please, join me next time as we continue walking through Virginia's history. Do 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 do